Professor Burina, you can start sharing your screen. So, سامح انت الاول كنت ارحب بالناس اما يدخلوا كلهم وبعدين باشا هو تيست تيست تمام what he was just trying to uh, because i think yeah. i think i told him that you want to try the to see if he, the sharing screen is good or not yeah it looks good right Two minutes to start. Uh, hi, H how are you? Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Polina, nice to meet you. Hi, John Chen, how are you? Well, nice to meet you too, Mohammed. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak in front of everybody um, today. It's our great pleasure actually to have uh, all of you between us and we hope this global pandemic uh, rapidly and we so we can uh, meet uh, physically again uh, inshallah yes I, I very much look forward to that <laughs> uh, I, I think it will run uh, we'll start by uh, introduction from Samah then we will go through our schedule uh, lectures according to uh, the schedule the program so we will have uh, these uh, nice updates in the spine surgery. Uh, at the end of each uh, lecture, we can have uh, some questions from the panels, or we can have some questions and answers from the participant as well. Uh, that will be great if we can finish uh, in proper time, because it is really well-preferred top-notch webinar. I can see amazing titles of lectures actually with amazing faculty. Okay, say so we will start now. Maybe. At the beginning, I'd like to welcome all professors, attendees, and eminent speakers that have accepted our invitation to give us their experience about updates on spine surgery. AWNC Academy is an online academy pioneer in learning of new surgery. For more than five years, we have till now 30,000 attendees and the members we done till now eight eight webinars at in these interviews till now uh, 22,000. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, dear uh, colleague, Dr. Mohammed Suleiman, who has uh, put all these uh, eminent speakers and lectures together. And we will start our welcoming of speakers then start our celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samah, for uh, your efforts and your team uh, in the Egyptian and World Neurosurgery Community Academy for their uh, enthusiasm to spread and exchange knowledge between spine practitioners all over the world. Today, it is uh, actually uh, in particular, we can say it is meet the masters. It is update session in spine surgery. You can have 
keynote lecture about the engineering in spine surgery, you can have some new techniques like prone position in the tra for trans-soas approach for a degenerative lumbar spine. You can have some new uh, techniques and the new uh, message for the intradural pathology. You will hear some tips and the tricks regarding the cervical thoracic and the craniovertebral junctional pathology and approaches. Plus, of course, all through this uh, webinar, you can have uh, interactive questions and answers, which can help you a lot uh, to uh, improve your skills and improve your knowledge in spine. And the, I will start actually uh, this webinar uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, John Polina. Uh, Dr. John Polina, Associate Professor of Neurosurgical uh, Surgery at the State of University uh, of New York. He's one of the pioneers in spine surgery in USA, and he will uh, give us his lecture regarding the prone trans psoas surgery for degenerative lumbar spine. Dr. John Polina, can you share your screen and we can start our uh, nice webinar? Yes, we'll see here. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, let me just get that and share. Great, there we go. Well, uh, thank you again. It's been uh, it's an honor and privilege uh, to spend time uh, with all the participants uh, today um, in uh, talking about a, a very novel uh, approach to the lumbar spine that's rapidly gaining um, sort of acceptance and popularity here in the United States. And I want to start by saying that uh, the prone chair and psoas approach or the PTP is a distinct procedure uh, from traditional or more, more commonly seen lateral trans psoas approach. And we'll talk about why that is and, and, and the advantages that the prone trans psoas approach has uh, in and of itself and the differences specific uh, uh, to it uh, in when you compare lateral trans psoas surgery. Um, let's see, here's my disclosures. So lateral uh, trans or inner body fusion has a long history. I began doing this uh, procedure back in the early 2000s. And that middle slide here, this x-ray, was one of my early cases where we used a cylindrical threaded cage. Um, we did a very large incision and uh, opened the psoas by hand and uh, placed these cylindrical cages laterally uh, without any monitoring, without any, any um, um, uh, significant uh, difference in implants that we're using um, doing anterior surgery or posterior surgery and basically took those uh, uh, techniques um, or should say those uh, instruments and um, implants and, and use them in the lateral approach. And while it was a good idea, it wasn't a great idea. We had, we had certainly some difficulties early on uh, for a variety of reasons here. You can see quite a bit of subsidence with the uh, cage. There was neurologic issues because of lack of ability to, to, to uh, monitor during the case. Um, and this led to kind of uh, an evolution in, in research into how to do this procedure more reliably, uh, validate the procedure, do it more safely. There were some attempts to try things in front of the psoas or anti psoas. Um, there were some endoscopic uh, um, approaches uh, that were, were, were attempted, all of which uh, didn't have really great great outcomes or satisfactory uh, um, uh, radiographs. Um, it wasn't until the early 2000s, and I give credit mostly to Dr. Pimenta, who uh, began to uh, validate um, the procedure uh, uh, in, and of, in, in and of itself, uh, primarily because of his ability to integrate the neuromonitoring uh, with the procedure and then develop implants specific to the procedure. And it was at that point um, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, the procedure began to gain uh, acceptance uh, because we can do it in a minimally invasive way, very reliably validate the procedure in terms of its outcome and do it most importantly, very safely because of the integrated monitoring that was uh, able to be done. And since this time, there's been tons of literature. I mean, you can just 
uh, go on Google Scholar and you can get uh, tons of uh, many, many papers that will validate and, and show uh, how safe the procedure can be done, the outcomes, the expected complications. Um, and, and, and really, um, I think over the last 20 years, it's gained acceptance as to be a valid tool that a spine surgeon can use in treating most pa uh, spinal pathologies. And there's lots of advantages to it. And again, this, the literature is, is full of this, um, you know, in regards to the advantages the lateral transoas approach has um, compared to more traditional posterior or even anterior approaches. And we all know what those advantages are. There's less blood loss, um, there's less infection rate, there's less use of intensive care. Uh, we see shorter hospitalizations, quicker recovery for our patients. Um, and this is largely because of it's a muscle preserving or anatomy preserving, I should say muscle splitting, anatomy preserving approach. There's less bone work. Um, we don't strip muscles off the spine. Um, so there's a lot of advantages that we see with this MIS lateral technique um, that we can take advantage of for the patients that result in you know, some, uh, some improved outcome uh, measures when we look at it. Um, the other advantages are this biomechanical. When we do lateral uh, inner body uh, placement of an implant, it's a much more biomechanically stable or stiff uh, construct in the, 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 the picture here on the left shows why the, the implant is much larger. It sits on the cortical apophyseal ring, which gives it a much stiffer sort of bone implant interface. And when you compare the fusion surfaces of a direct anterior or a PLIF or a T-LIF, you can see the, the, the advantages um, that the, the biomechanical advantages the uh, lateral inner body approach has. Um, you know, just by the implant uh, footprint uh, that that's, um, uh, we're able to use. And, and this, uh, this allows for more optimal fusion environment. We're able to, because we preserve anatomical structures like the ligaments, we can rely on ligamentotaxis to uh, load share on the, on the graft and again, stimulate um, uh, bony healing um, and, and, and fusion. And, and the, the other advantages too we, we saw over the years is, is that uh, with lateral inner body uh, approach, we're really good at correcting deformity, particularly coronal deformity, where we're able to approach either side of the curve depending upon the clinical uh, uh, condition and, and, and needs of the patient and really have a very powerful tool. And you can see here, very powerful tool from the lateral approach to correct coronal deformity. But what we noticed over the years and looking at it objectively that while we were really good at correcting coronal deformity, we had mild and modest ability um, in terms of sagittal correction with the exception of performing anterior, anterior uh, uh, ALL release or an ACR. And this is an example here where when we release the ALL, we really can uh, correct the sagittal plane very, very uh, um, powerfully, but, but it does come at some risk. And, um, and, and, and in general, the lateral approach absent releasing the ALL, doesn't do a great job at this, on the sagittal plane. It's a more of a distracting procedure. It, it does separate the vertebral bodies, increase the intral disc height very powerfully uh, with very mild and moderate sagittal correction. And so with all these advantages that we talk about with the lateral procedure, why isn't it widely adopted? It turns out only about 20% of spine surgeons um, actually use lateral transoas approach um, as part of their sort of surgical tools they have to treat their patients. And there's a several reasons. One is, is this, um, th there are opportunities to improve, of course, is, is the neural complications. And they're well documented, even with, um, you know, advances in uh, the neuromonitoring that we talked about earlier that really validated the procedure as being safe. You know, you can see here, there's not an insignificant number of uh, neurologic events, most of which are temporary, but, but it is quite disabling and troublesome for the patient and troublesome for the surgeon having a patient with quad weakness or iliopsoas weakness um, after surgery. The other, th other I think, um, barrier for surgeons is that this uh, idea of relying on indirect decompression. Now, now, a lot of work's been done on this, and it is a valid um, strategy is by using the inner body implant to decompress the central and peripheral nerve structures. Um, there is still some uh, uh, instances in which we're not able to, to achieve that and then requires the patient to have a direct decompression. And over the years with experience and some of the work with Juan Uribe, we were able to be more predictive of who we can 
uh, take advantage of uh, in terms of using indirect decompression and who will need a direct decompression, but it still requires or it still has uh, um, created a barrier for most surgeons um, to uh, adopt this procedure. And then the reality is, is putting patients in the lateral position is a hassle. It does require um, a team, a group of people, um, and, and time. Um, and then anything you want to do uh, posteriorly in general requires the patient to be flipped prone. And when you add up the time to put patients in the lateral position and then flip them to do anything posteriorly uh, in the prone position, um, surgeons are obviously time sensitive in their workflow. It just creates an aversion uh, to adopt the procedure. The other thing you will see too in, in the literature and gaining popularity, both um, in our peer reviewed uh, literature and in our, in our social media, media um, uh, uh, world is this single position surgery. And largely when people talk about that, um, they're talking about patients in the lateral position, either going trans-psoas or anti-psoas and um, trying to do the posterior, uh, posterior work, if you will, whether it's putting implants in or doing decompression, all in the lateral, uh, lateral, um, in the lateral position. Now this, and I can tell you from experience, is very difficult to do. Um, placing pedicle screws percutaneously or open uh, using navigation, floral or robotics is extremely difficult, technically challenging to do, particularly with the downside pedicles. And the literature is showing that the misplaced, uh, the, the rate of uh, reoperation and misplaced screws is much higher um, trying to do this single position surgery uh, because of the technical demands and difficulty um, that, that are, that are, um, are created um, in this position. We're also limited in what we can do. We can only do small, maybe one or two level constructs um, doing single position surgery in the lateral position. And so obviously that limits the, the patients we can treat and what we're able to do. And then frankly, doing any bone work, osteotomies, decompressions in the lateral position for me is impossible. It's very technically challenging um, and, and really not, not something that I, I certainly would advocate or, or to train any of my trainees uh, to do. And so the solution to this was a procedure that we began to develop maybe three or four years ago and have had, and then has rapidly started to gain popular, popularity here in the States. And that's called the prone transoas approach. And I alluded earlier that this is a distinct procedure from a lateral prone surgery. You'll see these words um, uh, kind of um, bounced around. And we want to be clear that when we talk about PTP or prone, trans, prone transoas approach, it's a distinct procedure in and of itself. And we'll talk about that um, 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 uh, later on in the talk. But what it does is it creates immediate workflow efficiencies. We're really doing, this is real single position surgery. The patient's in the prone position. We have access to all the prone anatomical structures to do whatever it is we want. It doesn't require a flip. It's a very straightforward positioning um, technique when we put patients in the prone position every day. And so as spine surgeons, we're very comfortable putting the position, it's very a patient in that position. It's very efficient to do. It's comfortable um, in terms of um, uh, in how we work. We work in the prone position on patients. Um, and, then, and then it also allows us the advantages of all the lateral inner body, um, uh, with the lateral inner body approach um, can give us that we talked about earlier. Um, we can do minimally invasive uh, operations. We could use big implants. Um, we have access to the anterior column as well as the posterior column. And then we, we, can, we, can, we can have direct access, whether it be to decompression or osteotomies, um, to do uh, posterior column work as well as do anything at L5-S1. We all do L5-S1 inner body fusions or decompressions. We can gain access to that, which becomes impossible um, in a single position lateral approach. The other thing in which I think uh, we'll talk about um, uh, later, I'll show you, uh, illustrate it later, is that in the position, this is a very lordosing, sagittally, uh, um, uh, very lordosing um, uh, procedure in the sense that the positioning um, uh, it, it creates lordosis. And so the earlier limitations we talked about in the lateral transoas approach, the in, in regards to the sagittal plane, the prone transoas approach overcomes them. And it's a very sagittally um, uh, a beneficial um, uh, approach in, in, in restoring alignment uh, for our patients. 
The way it's done um, is we use a standard uh, Jackson table and we put these um, and we've developed these over time, these novel bolsters, we call them positional bolsters. Um, and what that allows us to do is to allow the abdo abdomen to hang free and really creates a very lordotic um, uh, posture for the patient on the table. And we'll illustrate this later, showing you how well we're able to re realign the spine in the sagittal plane because of this. And these lateral bolsters actually move in the coronal plane. Um, and so that we can not only correct deformity, we're able to move the crest down, particularly for L4-5, so that we can gain access easier um, uh, to, the, to those levels. And as I stated before, we have complete access to the dorsal columns, if you will, or the posterior columns of the uh, spine, um, all the way down to the sacrum. So we can, we can do what we need to do posteriorly all in one position. We talked about the coronal, uh, the, the, the bolsters, the novel bolsters, and this is why this procedure, PTP, is very uh, different than um, prone lateral procedures that you'll talk about. It's not, it, it, and one of the things is this bolster that's been designed specifically to the procedure. You also notice, unlike some prone lateral uh, procedures that illustrated, there's no taping. The patient's secured in the bolsters with the strap. And the bolsters are able to move coronally as well. And here we're able to gain access to this disc space by rotating the, the, the pelvic bolsters um, down to allow the iliac crest to be moved to gain uh, very parallel access to the disc space that otherwise would have been more challenging. Um, uh, and then, and then uh, additionally, um, when we um, identify our uh, disc space, we, we start to mark out some anatomical landmarks that are very different than lateral prone or lateral transoas. We want the approach to the spine to be somewhat more posterior. So we'll line up our posterior foraminal um, a a line and an anterior uh, foraminal line, a mid disc and an anterior vertebral body line and approach the spine more posteriorly and then dock more anteriorly. Remember, we're dealing with gravity and we've developed We'll show this later a specific retractor for this procedure um, so that we're able to reproducibly and safely um, approach the spine um, in this approach um, and, and, and gain access to the anterior column and disc space. And so once we line up everything and get our orthogonal uh, AP and lateral fluoroscopies, the approach is very similar. It's a retroperitoneal approach that's been well described in the lateral transoas. We, um, we gain access to the retroperitoneal space, start to uh, put our dilators down, as you see here, gaining access to the retroperitoneal space, putting our dilators through the uh, psoas muscle, and then uh, stimulating or using the neuromonitoring to make sure that our, our approach and our docking um, uh, location um, is, is, is safe in, in regards to where the uh, um, uh, lumbar plexus is. And once we um, get to the uh, disc space, you, you can see here, it's very similar to lateral transoas in the regards that we have a guide wire, our retractor goes over the dilators and guide wire, we open the retractor, place a shim to, to allow us to uh, have a stable retractor. You'll see here, this is an older version where we have disc, uh, we have um, uh, screw shims in the vertebral body. We've removed this and I'll show you later uh, what we've replaced um, um, this with a very novel retractor system. But the thing to keep in mind is the, the basic tenets of lateral surgery stay the same in that we wanna stay orthogonal to the disc space so that we're able to safely prepare the disc space for placement of our inner body graft. The other and not to be understated advantage is the ergonomics of this for the surgeon. Um, those of us who do a lot of lateral transoas surgery know that at the end of the day, the, our upper thoracic neck, our back really is quite uh, uh, sore because we're leaning over the back of the patient to look down the retractor. Here we have a much more ergonomic um, workflow, if you will, um, and where you have the surgeon, this is a surgeon sitting and he's able to look directly uh, down the retractor into the, uh, across the disc space, or, and this is my workflow, I'm, I'm a shorter person, so I, I like to stand um, and I just rotate the bed uh, away from me and I can look right down the retractor 
uh, blade. And it's actually very um, easy for assistants or trainees to work with you or you to watch what they're doing because you can look just over their shoulder as you see here, um, um, unlike with lateral transoas where you have to take turns looking in. The other advantage I want to point out in this picture here, here's, a, here's another, here's one of the surgical uh, uh, residents as we're doing the inner body, they're opening the posterior. So you develop a very efficient workflow. Um, you're getting exposure to your, your posterior, uh, to do your posterior work, whether it's osteotomies, decompressions, um, uh, fixation, um, and while, you're, while you're completing your, your anterior column work. And then the disc prep stuff, uh, disc prep, prep part of the procedure is all the same in terms of principles. We want to preserve the apophyseal ring. We want to create an optimal environment for the bony fusion. And then we want to create a, a, channel, a channel for our implant to go in safely. And, you know, there's a variety of peak or, or now we're using lots of metal in the disc space um, that, that are advantageous to create um, a bony Bony healing and then closing of the of the wound is, is the same as it was for lateral transoas. So there's a lot of sim similarities, but there are distinct differences, not only uh, in, in the prone transoas, but prone tra the PTP and lateral lateral prone. There's very distinct differences um, that we we uh, we just illustrated here. The other advantage too, as we're seeing, is that the prone in the prone position, the lumbar plexus. This is an MRI um, uh, study that we did. Um, and, and basically what it shows is with the leg, uh, with the hip extended and the legs in neutral position, um, the, the, the psoas muscle actually migrates posteriorly with the uh, lumbar plexus. And this gives us the advantage of that we have more access to the disc space uh, remote from the lumbar plexus, primarily the femoral nerve, making it, um, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, giving us our ability to put larger, larger implants in and making it safer in that the, the, the lumbar plexus is more posterior, particularly with us, our ability to, to dock more anterior, we're able to get the, get the safe access to the disc space more reliably. And then we'll talk about early, uh, later, but we'll, that segues into what makes the procedure, I, I think, uh, safer is that we have uh, a novel uh, integrated um, monitoring uh, uh, platform called SafeOp. Now, traditionally, when we did lateral transoas or exit procedure, we were only able to monitor trigger EMG. So basically, as we approached the uh, disc space, we located the nerve uh, by creating a trigger uh, and monitoring the EMG function, and um, it would give us proximity of the nerve to the retractor and location of the nerve posterior to the retractor. And then we would go with our dilators and our retractor and then proceed with the procedure. But the thing to keep in mind is that the rest of the procedure remained unmonitored. We didn't know how well we were doing in terms of nerve integrity and nerve health uh, and nerve continuity even um, because the, um, the rest of the procedure, um, we just did not, we didn't have the ability to, to, to uh, get that information. And the SAFOP procedure, which is integrated in the platform of PTP, allows for this. Um, and there's been lots of attempts for this um, uh, over the years, but they've all failed. And what SAFOP uh, does is it actually gives us saphenous nerve SSEPs, which as you know, the saphenous nerve is a terminal branch of the femoral nerve, which at L45 particularly is what we wanna monitor. There have been other attempts, primarily with the posterior tibial nerve, but this is um, very difficult, if not impossible, and frankly is, is not um, the nerve necessarily we, we're most interested in. We're interested in the femoral nerve. So to be able to get SSCP uh, waveforms uh, uh, of the saphenous nerve being the terminal branch of the femoral nerve, that gives us real-time nerve integrity information as we're doing the procedure. So if you think about it, we can, in the past, we would, we would be able to locate the nerve and then not really know what we're doing to the nerve during the procedure. Patients would wake up with deficits, some of them temporary, um, uh, most of them temporary, some of them permanent. But now with this new uh, integrated um, uh, nerve, uh, nerve monitoring platform called SAFOP into the PTP procedure, we're able to get real-time nerve integrity, nerve health information, so we, could, we can make adjustments uh, during the procedure if we start to see changes. And uh, this is um, um, a, a, a perfect example of, of how this um, becomes an advantage for us. This is um, a case where we started, um, we had really good what we call triggers. The nerve was posterior to the blade. We, uh, the triggers were high, so we didn't have um, 
there weren't it, the proximity to the posterior blade wasn't uh, wasn't a concern and we had really good waveforms on the SSEP of the saphenous nerve and about 20 minutes into the procedure we started to lose amplitude and this uh, alerted us to uh, make a change and typically what we'll do as an initial move is we'll just close the retractor for a little while to let the the nerve recover typically this is an ischemic uh, um, uh, issue uh, on the femoral nerve, let it let it recover, and then continue um, uh, along the procedure. And this um, has we've seen, you know, uh, our ability to avert nerve injury uh, because of this, because we're getting real live, real time nerve integrity and nerve health information. And so, and so, all of these um, factors, if you will. Um, are created um, to do the PTP procedure um, very reliably uh, and safely. Um, and it's been validated over a thousand cases now um, that we've done. And I again want to stress to you, the procedure is unique in and of itself. This is not a repurposed lateral procedure. This is a procedure that's been thought of um, to overcome the challenges um, specific to the prone lateral um, approach or the prone transoas approach um, so that we can, as surgeons, do this um, more safely and frankly more effectively in regards to um, what we need to do for our patients. And I'll illustrate that with a few cases. This is a, a patient, a 72-year-old, who underwent a previous L4 to S1 fusion, um, came back eight years later with progressive disability from back and leg pain, failed uh, a long course of physical therapy, uh, phys uh, non-operative treatment, including physical, th physical therapy and, and injections. Uh, MRI showed adjacent segment breakdown here, stenosis at the L3-4 level. You can see it on the axial circumferential uh, stenosis. His uh, standing x-rays um, show a, pelv a lumbar pelvic mismatch of almost 30 degrees uh, with a segmental kyphosis of about 10 degrees. Um, and you can see the PIL mismatch here at 28. Um, and, and just a he has flat back deformity. Uh, he's got deformity in the sagittal alignment. His SVA is 14. So he's got sagittal deformity. He's got instability, uh, a grade one spondylolisthesis at L5S1. And he's been previously operated on um, at L4 to 1. So, um, you know, there's any number of ways to do this, but the lateral transoas would not be able to accomplish correction in the sagittal plane correction of the kyphosis, correction of the lordosis to, to get a better spinal pelvic matching. And so we opted to do a PTP operation. Here the patient's positioned in the, in the, in the bolsters we talked about. Um, in the bolsters, this is the preoperative x-ray at L3-4 was the operative level. We had a 10 degree kyphosis. In the bolster alone, because of uh, the uniqueness of it, we're able to already correct the kyphosis and start to you see you start to see res restoration of the lumbar lordosis and this is before any work was done any anterior column work any posterior column work and it just shows the power of the positioner and the patient bolsters what we're able to accomplish um, just on the bed itself um, and then we went ahead and we uh, began our we we chose to do the lateral inner body first and here you'll see this is the newest and novel retractor specifically designed. It's a two-blade retractor, very lightweight, with a very rigid, what we call A-frame a re, uh, retractor holder. Um, again, because we were dealing with gravity as opposed to, you know, direct anterior or direct lateral, where the patient's, um, the gravity actually um, uh, has the retractor lean up against the, the, the patient. Here, we need, to, we need to adjust for that. And this is why lateral retractors um, repurpose for the prone transoas that don't work well. We, we, we've, we've seen that and we specifically designed this retractor for the procedure. It gives us the, 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 the ability to view um, the disc space as you see here, and this is just where the retractor is first going down um, in, 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 a, in a way, in a less invasive way, uh, so that we can then um, do our inner body work or anterior column work. Here, again, this is just some, some um, intraoperative x-rays, the disc prep, there you see the retractor, the disc prep is, is the same, and then, and then the final AP and lateral um, x-ray uh, that we get in the operating room where we're completing the prone approach, and this again is before any of the uh, posterior uh, work is done. And remember, he, he has circumferential stenosis, 
Um, and we do need, because of the instability here, I, he, does, does, he would benefit from posterior fixation. So we can go right ahead. Um, here you see this is intraoperative x-ray. We can go and marry into his prior construct, uh, add pedicle screws at three, and accomplish everything in one position. Uh, correct the coronal deform, uh, correct the coronal sagittal, uh, correct the nerve, uh, the, the, the nerve compression, and add fixation all in one position. And here is preoperative standing x-ray with a PIL mismatch of 29 degrees. And here now we, we got the 20 degree correction uh, and, and, and corrected the spinal pelvic uh, uh, mismatch by improving, increasing his lordosis. And we see this regularly now without doing any anterior column release or ALL release. We're getting 18, 15, 18, 20 degrees correction just in the position itself doing standard disc prep and implant uh, 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 placement. I'll just go over and here, this is the standing films and um, uh, much, this is the preoperative SVA, it was 14 and postoperatively we got him back to five, which is in the normal, um, in the normal uh, range. I, I know we're getting short on time. I'll just go through one, one other. And here you see this, the, the correction, it's a 20 degree correction from 10 degree kyphosis to 10 degree lordosis. I'll just show you one quick, this is a 60 year old who had prior surgery. Um, you know, back in leg pain, the uh, had a erosion of the upper screws into the three, four disc space. It, you see almost 20 degree spinal pelvic mismatch prior surgery posteriorly, as well as a coronal deformity. Um, this is the CT scan. You can see the operative level, the three, four uh, eroded um, from the, uh, the prior screws. Uh, there's a non-union at L4, 5. Um, and we're able to um, approach this. This is some intraoperative filming, get our um, uh, incisions um, mapped out. And then we're able to, uh, these are postoperative x-rays, able to correct the uh, deformity, place uh, uh, in, uh, implant in the uh, anterior column, um, supplement the fixation, revise the old fixation all in one position. And um, the, 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 again, the, the advantage again in the, in the sagittal plane, the Lord dosing ability of this procedure is evident. We're able to bring the patient back to normal spinal pelvic matching parameters. I think I was supposed to stop at 9.30, so I'm gonna stop here and um, see if anybody has any questions. I know I covered a lot of information quickly. Thank you so much, uh, John. It is very interesting uh, lecture highlighting the importance of uh, using one position for finishing the procedure. There are uh, three questions we have here. Can you do this procedure navigated? Yes, so that's a great question. We're, we, we can, and uh, we use um, either 3D navigation and are in the process of validating 2D navigation that would just be used off the fluoro. So the short answer to the question is you can and we do, and it can be very helpful. Uh, we even uh, have done cases where we would do the posterior uh, fixation robotically. So you can add that to the procedure. And the reality is, is you have the spine surrounded. And so anything you do normally posteriorly or laterally, you, you, you can accomplish um, with PTP. Okay, uh, John, regarding the patient positioning, you put the patient prone with hip mm -hmm. extension, that means the psoas is tight and the neural structure inside the psoas is stretched as well. That may cause a uh, hazardous effect on the nerves. I don't know where that question came from. That's a great, great question. Um, and we're, we're, we've learned that with our experience. So, um, when you do lateral transoas, we will often break the bed and in hopes of uh, getting the crest out of the way. And so we took that principle with prone transoas uh, using our patient positioning bolsters and we would really coronally pull the pelvis down. What we were finding is uh, before we even did anything, we were getting nerve changes. And so what we've learned is to not use, the bolsters are very, uh, are very powerful in the coronal plane. So we don't do much um, um, with the iliac crest. Um, so the workaround then is, well, how do you get the crest out of the way? The reality is with the two blade retractor, we have about 10 more degrees of freedom. And so we're able to gain access to the L45 
uh, disk space without having to really pull down the uh, 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 iliac crest. But the, the observation no. uh, by the questioner is absolutely right, is that the nerve is posterior and it is, it is it, it, we're finding that it looks, sounds like it's, or uh, seems to be under, under tension and so not to be too aggressive with the coronal uh, uh, bender. Okay, last question. In yeah. degenerative scoliosis, yeah. from which side you approach? Convex side, concave side, especially you said that you need to be uh, in special parallel para, in your technique parallel to the disc so yeah. injective scolio so how in, we will approach yes in general i i approach it on the concavity um and if you could if you think if you draw parallel lines of each of the uh, disc space they'll converge to one area so it allows us to make a smaller incision and still sort of wand up and down to the disc space to in access and correct the coronal deformity. The exception to that can be at L45. If the, the, the pelvis is high and the disc is um, sort of looking or angling into the pelvis, I have to uh, approach that on the opposite side. And so here is the other advantage with PTP is you can not approach the spine on both sides, unlike lateral transoas where you're committed to one side or the other. I can do some on the left and then some on the right. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Uh, we have some more questions. You can answer them in the chat uh, box because we need to go through the uh, rest of the scheduled program. We're so happy having you between us. And the next 